Something wasn't working me. Even way back then, something called conscience, right? And so today, what I'd like to talk with you about is your conscience and see what God has to say to us about this inner voice that we all have that commends us or convicts us. Where'd you get it? Who gave it to you? What is it? What's its purpose? And especially, can you always trust it to lead you in the way? That is right. What's God say to us about our conscience? And especially, how can we live out our lives in this world with a clear conscience? Isn't that the most beautiful thing? Joyful and free like the bulletin cover? A clear conscience before God, before others, and before ourselves, too. So what's God say to us about our conscience? Well, first thing we can recognize here is that conscience something very important to the apostles. Most of them mention it right through all their letters. Listen to just a few of them. Here's Paul. He's talking to uh, Felix the governor, making his case, and he says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and toward men. Then we can turn over to 2 Timothy. At chapter 1, verse 3, he says to Timothy, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, as did my fathers. Then we jump over to 2 Corinthians 1, verse 12. For our boast is this, the testimony of our, say it, conscience, that we've behaved in the world and still more toward you with holiness and godly sincerity. Then you can look over at Hebrews, the author of the Hebrews, and he says there in Hebrews 13, verse 18, he says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. And then Peter chimes in in 1 Peter 3, 15. And he says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. But yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep your conscience clear, says Peter, so that when you are abused, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So, would you say that conscience is important to the apostles? Do you know what? You bet it is. <laughs> and it was even a foundation or part of the Christian life. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. So God wants you to have a clear conscience and it's very important. But let's ask this next question. What is it? What is your conscience? Well, I'm going to use a little one here, although I had a much bigger one on my ship. It's like a compass, right? Which tells you the way that you are to go. I remember when I was uh, 
traveling on the ships. One time, as you, I think I shared this story with you, I was uh, skippering a schooner up in Maine into Camden Harbor in a dense fog. I had probably 20 some people as passengers on that boat. But the channel was narrow. On my left, I had a rocky island. On my right, I had a rocky ledge just below the surface. There was little margin for error. If I turned that way, shipwreck. That way, shipwreck. Straight ahead, the only safe course. As I was going, I looked at the wind and the sea and the waves, how they were moving, the little wind that we had. And I thought my mind, my senses, my eyes, my ears, my gut tells me, turn left, turn left. I looked over at the compass. I looked at the radar. And it said, go right, go right. What did I do? <laughs> I hope I didn't go left. I went right. I listened to the radar. I listened to the compass. And I went from boat to boat, mark to mark, channel marker to channel marker, straight to the dock, and safe. And avoided shipwreck. And in the same way, God has placed into us a conscience like a compass, like an inner radar to guide us in the way that is right, that we avoid the shipwreck of our souls. You guys have felt your conscience, right? You know that voice inside? Let me give you a biblical example. First, Timothy, uh, first uh, Samuel 24. Saul was hunting David. King Saul was hunting David in the wilderness. When Saul heard, was told that David was in the wilderness of En Gedi, uh, Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of, his, out of Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. He had to go to the John. Nice way of saying that. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord has said to you, I'll give your enemy into your hand. You shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. In other words, kill him, they were suggesting. David arose and stealthily cut off the skirt of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Saul's skirt. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put forth my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went upon his way. So what do we see operating 3,000 years ago in a human being? Conscience. And notice here, oftentimes our conscience is at odds with what we think we want to do, what we feel like doing, with what we would like to do. David wanted, and the men encouraged him, go kill him, or at least disgrace him by cutting off the skirt of his robe. And as he starts to do that stealthily, as I stealthily stole those scissors, David's heart smote him. He was struck in his heart. That's his conscience spoke to him and said, no, no, David, no, that's not the right way to go. That's wrong. That's morally wrong. Do this. This is the right way to go. Go there. And what did David do? He listened to his conscience. He obeyed it. He went in the way that was right, turned aside from the wrong. And that compass guided him safely into the harbor. And he avoided shipwreck. Because if he really killed Saul, the Lord's anointed, and not let the Lord take care of justice, he would not have become king might have even been killed. So it's important that we follow these, this conscience that we have, that God has given to us. Now I want to ask you a question. Will you listen to it? That's the real question, isn't it? Up until now, it's like a piece of cake. Of course, conscience, I got it. But will you listen? It's that inner voice that convicts you when you are guilty, when you're doing something wrong. And it also commends you when you do right. Go uh, help an old lady across the street who can't get across the street. What do you feel? Good. Why? Your conscience. Even unbelievers feel this, don't they? But will you listen to it? That's the question I ask you. Or not. Well, to answer that, we need to ask, ask another question. Where did you get it? Who gave it to you? Where did it come from? Where did you get this inner voice that convicts or commends you inside? And is sometimes very annoying to us. You know, Naomi told me, uh, some time ago at school, you know, all the people are doing this, 
and then my conscience tells me I can't do that, and I gotta go this way, and it's really bothersome, it's always there. I don't get to have all this other fun. Now, it doesn't turn us away from real fun, but it does turn us away from wrong, and it can be annoying. <laughs> but where did we get it? God gave it to you. Take a look at Romans chapter two. We read here, Paul says, verse 14 and 15, it says, when Gentiles, you know, non-Jews, who do not have the law, doesn't have the Bible, when they do by nature what the law requires, there are laws of themselves, even though they don't have the law. In other words, they're doing right, even though they don't have the scriptures. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So what's that telling you? Who gave you your conscience? Answer. God gave it to you. And what did he do? He wrote into your heart, wired into the human beings, a knowledge of right and wrong, so that we can discern between right and wrong. So we're unlike the animals in this way, right? Animals don't know morality, but God's wired into us. If you take little birds, they know, and it's wired into them, to understand the stars. They've actually taken experiments, putting birds, a little nest, into a planetarium with no parent to instruct them and they can orient themselves according to which star is which. They know the directions of the stars. Why? God wired it into them. In the same way God has wired into each human being a conscience to know what is right and wrong, as Paul says, written on their hearts. But the problem is not everybody believes that, right? Does everybody want to know that there's a conscience that they have? What do we try to do with our conscience when we don't like the way it's pointing us? Right? You're talking on the phone, what do you do? <laughs> Can't hear you. Hang up. Actually, Naomi showed me this great video she watched recently at, at uh, school. Creation versus evolution. And uh, this Christian interviewer intervie interviews this liberal college professor. And that liberal college professor is very smug, proud of his knowledge. Christian interviewer asks, is there such a thing, uh, professor, as absolute morals? where something's absolutely right or wrong all the time. Oh, of course not, says the professor. There is no God, therefore there are no absolute morals. <laughs> well, the Christian interviewer then said, then can you give me an example, professor, of a case in which the rape of an underage girl is, is right? No, I can't. Then you believe then, professor, in absolute morals. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know why I had to say that? The testimony of his conscience was bearing witness inside him. It is always wrong to rape somebody. We all know that. Just like the children's sermon, you know what's right and wrong, even without having read the Bible. And this is why all the religions of the world, even if they are totally messed up and wrong on salvation, they still know it's wrong to murder, wrong to steal, wrong to commit adultery, wrong to lie. And as the German philosopher Immanuel Kant said, two things fill my mind with ever-increasing wonder and awe. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. So do you guys have a conscience? Have you all felt it? Convicting or commending you? based on what is right or wrong? Good, God's given it to you. But now I need to ask you, is your con if your conscience is a compass, and everyone has this compass inside them, this knowledge of right and wrong, why isn't the world just peachy keen? <laughs> why is there so much wrong in the world? Why is it so full of pain and bad decisions? What's the answer? Not everybody wants to listen to the conscience. It's screaming on the other end of the line. What do you do when you don't hear it? You hold the phone away from your ear. You might even hang up on it to squash it and get rid of it. So some listen to their consciences, some don't, but listen to the consequences of not following your conscience. Verse 19 of 1 Timothy 1, Paul says to Timothy, Hold faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have made shipwreck of their faith. So, if, you, if I sail into Camden Harbor in the fog in a 
dense, thick as pea soup fog, and I choose to ignore my compass and radar, what happens to my ship? Shipwreck. If you ignore your conscience, what happens to your soul? Shipwreck. And so we need to be very wary, and this is a scary and dangerous thing, that when you reject conscience, you know what happens to it? It gets weaker and weaker until it goes away altogether. Let me give you an example of that, okay? Take a pirate, for example. A pirate like for me, right? <laughs> you go to sea as a young man, and you have your first raid on a, on a, on a ship, and you kill a man. You slay him. What do you probably feel? Guilty. You're convicted. He's troubled. What do his other shipmates, the older pirates, do? Oh, lad, the man deserved it. Have a drink. And he goes and gets drunk, but he still feels guilty. Goes to the next ship, another couple days later. Kills somebody else. This time, he still feels guilty, but a little less so, right? Have another drink. He deserved it. And then, by several more raids later, he can do it and kill and go to sleep at night and not even have a nightmare. He's slaughtered during the day, no more feeling of conscience. And then if that continues, eventually they attack and raid another ship. He kills a man and he actually enjoys it. A thirst for blood. His conscience has been slain or at least turned off, let's say. And so I warn you today, if you have your conscience and it's telling you go this way, don't go this way, beware. Every time you hold it away from your ear or hang up on it, it grows weaker and weaker. Let me give you a modern example. Take a nice young girl, virgin, goes to college. She wants to fit in with her friends, so she goes to a fraternity party, gets a little drunk at night, doesn't know what she's doing, wakes up next to a stranger, finds out she slept with him. What's she feel? What's her conscience say? Guilty. 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 And actually at college, remember they call it a walk of shame. She's doing the walk of shame. There she goes across the quad. Walk of shame. And so she's feeling terrible and it's haunting her. The alarm bells are going off. Conscience is screaming with red, red sirens. But her friends come along and say, come on girl. Everybody does it. Welcome to adulthood. Don't feel so bad. Have a drink. Short time. She goes to another party, and it happens again, less guilty, another party, eventually no guilt, and eventually she ends up enjoying it, because what she's doing is, when you walk into sin and ignore conscience, it gets weaker and begins to go to destruction. 1 Timothy 1, verse 4, we read this. I took out the tab, did I? I'll read it, it's here. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by giving heed to deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons, through the pretensions of liars whose consciences are seared, etc., etc. What does it mean when your conscience is seared? What does it mean to sear something? To sear it, to burn it, as with a hot branding iron. He says in the last days there'll be those whose consciences are, it's as if you took a a branding iron and burn it. What happens if you have a cut or a wound and you burn it? You, you cauterize it, you scar it, but then you cease to feel it, right? Because all the nerves have been burned away. You don't even feel it. If you have a bad burn, if it's deep enough, you don't even feel it because the nerves are gone. And so that's what God would warn us today, that when I preach a sermon, let's say, and the your conscience... I might not even have said something, but your conscience says, hey, you know, pastor's talking about this. What about that? What about this? Remember that. You need to repent of this. And you go, hmm, no, nah, it's not really that bad. Hang up the phone. What's going to happen? You're going toward a weaker and weaker state. You're searing that conscience so you don't feel it. What happens at the end of uh, rejecting a conscience? Ship wreck of your soul. So we need to avoid that kind of thing. If the Holy Spirit, or your conscience that is, convicts you of something, they're not the same by the way, but if the Holy Spirit works with your conscience, if he convicts you of your sin and says this is the wrong way to go, don't do it. Whatever it takes, avoid shipwreck. God is not uh, joking here. The wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot rest. Its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. 
If you turn away from conscience, you're going down that path. Don't go down it. But when you do what's right, your conscience commends you. Peace, peace, says the Lord, to the far end of the air, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Same passage, Isaiah 57. So, next question I want to ask you. And you need to answer it. Make sure you're all with me, okay? Can you always follow your conscience? Does it always direct you in the right way? We all got a conscience. And if your conscience is good and rightly calibrated as a good compass, follow it. The trouble is, what else we got inside of us? Sin. What happens when you're trying to make a decision to go the right way? There's a war inside. What's that happening? You get the passions of your flesh fighting against that compass, and it's very confusing, and it throws it off. It can throw off your inner compass. Hence, you have people who can lie, who can cheat, who can steal, who can sleep around outside of marriage, and do all those things and feel nothing wrong with it. I have no kind of conscience. I've been in it long enough, and I've squelched it, and my compass is not reading right anymore. I've I've quieted it down. And so you've got to be aware of those kinds of things. Uh, can you follow your conscience? No, because uh, that is when you have these passions at work within you, if it's skewed off. But what do we need to do then to get right back to a right conscience? One that is rightly calibrated. Because some people think, I can go ahead and sleep around and it doesn't bother me. Conscience isn't there, right? What do you need to do to set this thing right again? Well, when I was on a ship, and any time Pete would know this, if you're on a steel ship, Pete, and you've got your compass, your binnacle there before the wheel, what do you have on either side of the compass? Yeah, you got bars, or, or these, on my ship, it'd be two steel metal balls, right? Because your, yeah, your compass is reading not only the North Pole, but it's also reading off the metallic magnetism of the ship, right? And so it's off. You put these two steel balls next to it, calibrate it properly, and the compass will read correctly. In the same way, we have a compass on our metal ship, but our passions around us tend to skew the compass. What do we need to do to set that conscience right again so that it reads properly? You need to put on either side of your compass the word of God, right? A steel ball of the word, a steel ball of the word, and when you are calibrated according to the word, all of a sudden, it'll teach you right. Because where do you hear about right and wrong? Where do you hear it? In the scriptures, right? Your conscience is supposed to tell you right and wrong. It's not always correct because it's been wounded by sin. When you put the word of God into you, and you check everything by that, then your conscience is now rightly calibrated, and you can be convicted or commended rightly. Because some people might sleep around and say, I'm commended, I feel great. Wrong. You're reading off the metallic structure of your ship. It's wrong. Or you might even be, feel guilty when you're innocent. Because you're convicted in a way that you're wrongly done. But if you have the word of God always with you and in you, then you can read it rightly and it teaches you the right way to go. This teaches you the right way. Your conscience picks up on that and will tell you, hey, that's right. You're doing a good thing, Greg. Keep going. That's good. Or, oh, don't go there, Greg. Don't touch that. That's wrong. Do you listen to your conscience? Will you listen to your conscience? I hear an eerie silence, but I am accepting <laughs> the answer is a yes. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We set our inner conscience by Jesus. He says also, thy word is a lamp to to my feet and a light to my path. And if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. And truly I say to you, says Jesus, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Not everybody's conscience in the world is going to work rightly or be felt or heard correctly. But if we keep Jesus' word, it avoids shipwreck and leads us straight and safe home all through your life. And you know how great it feels to have a good, clear conscience? What's it feel like if you have a bad conscience? David said, When I declared not my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Have you ever done something wrong? Have you ever stolen some scissors from the Girl Scouts? 
<laughs> you have something else like that in your mind or your heart that's convicting you, what happens? <clears throat> oh, you feel weighed and heavy. If you have all the world, and your conscience is not clear, you have nothing. But if the world comes against you with all of its fierce attacks, but you have a clear conscience, you have everything. You stand up to it free and clear and bold because there is an integrity inside of you that stands and bears witness you're doing right. And God with the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're walking in the way that's right. It's so precious. And so how do you have a clear conscience then? How do you get this thing that's worth its weight more in gold? Well, your conscience hounds you for sin and the world has no answers for you. How to shake it off. How to get a free... And clear. Look at the woman. Where is she? Look at this woman. Don't you want to look like that? Apart from the part she's female if you're a man. <laughs> she is exuberantly free. That is a free conscience. How do you get that? Well, the ancient world tried to figure it out. Hercules. Hercules, because his, uh, the goddess uh, Hera made him insane for a night, he killed, his, he killed his family. He woke up, they were slain, he killed them. He felt a terrible kind of guilt. Blood guilt, the ancients would call it. And and he went to his cousin, the king, saying, what can I do to get rid of this guilt for killing my family? He goes and does all kinds of 12 miracles, fights, slays dragons, beats beasts, holds up the world on his shoulders, goes to Hades and back, and what did all that do to get rid of his guilt? Nothing. It didn't do nothing. And in the end, Hercules commits suicide because there was no remedy for his conscience. But... For us, we have something far better than that, and I can declare to you the truth today, friends. The blood of Jesus Christ conquers guilt because he conquers sin, and he atones for it, and he makes your conscience clear. Say that. Clear. Clear, clear and free conscience. For it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, it says, If the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of the heifer, it sanctifies for the purification of the flesh. In other words, that's the old covenant. How much more shall the blood of Jesus Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He sets your conscience free. You can go through all the rest of your life from this day on in Jesus free and not hounded and haunted by guilt. For Jesus said to the woman who came to him who was a sinful woman, he says, go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. What did he do? She wept at his feet in her conscience feeling guilty. She left Jesus having believed in him, joyful and free, forgiven. It's Jesus Christ, having died for you, friends, and risen again from the dead, who forgives your sins and sets your conscience free and clear. So confess your sins. And Peter says, baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through Jesus Christ. Baptism is another thing God does to confirm you and strengthen. Live with a free conscience. That's what I want for you. Not to be weighed down, to be jubilant and excited. Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, let's draw near with a true heart, with full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, referring to baptism. So the law has been canceled. Your sin has been nailed there. Why then are you still feeling guilty? If you have confessed your sins. So... Jesus cleanses our consciences of past sins, and then what do you got to do? The Holy Spirit leads you in the way that is right, according to the Word. And He works closely with your conscience. When you go the wrong way to convict, when you go the right way to commend you, and listen to Him and walk in it. For a guilty conscience is truly like the horror of a sinking ship at sea. But the blessing of a clear conscience is like a clear blue sky on a cloudless morning with no guilt, no trouble, no pain inside. Even if there's all trouble in the world outside, a clear conscience 
is a gift of God and what he wants you to walk in. For the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. So the aim of our charge, I'll conclude with this, Paul says the aim of our charge is love. That this is from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. God bless us in that, in Jesus' name.